This is House Planning Help, episode 258. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build, because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Coming up in this session, my guest is Neil Sutherland from Macar, and we're going to be looking at using a turnkey design and build company to deliver your ecological home. First, though, I always bring learnings to you as and when they happen to me. It happened through my entire project and now nine months into living in the house. Not much crops up, really, if I'm totally honest. But recently we had a day where we got up to 34 Celsius outside. That's not in the house. That would have been serious overheating, but it was overheating that I thought this will be the perfect opportunity to test whether the house is going to overheat because it's been modelled that it will never go over. 25 celsius i always find that a bit strange that do they not just put in perhaps a little bit of a percentage that will overheat in, in case it doesn't but take into account the design of the house the climate data etc so far that is what it said so would it happen if i closed all the windows and i did we've got various temperature sensors around the house and it got to 25.5 celsius so what did I learn? Well, actually, it was only afterwards that here I am, Mr. Smug, in my house that's been modelled not to go over 25 Celsius. Because when you come back in from 34 to 25, it feels like you've got the air conditioning on. Bit of magic. It's the summer comfort, as they like to call it, isn't it? But what I discovered is that will only happen, so it will stay 25 or below, only if there's been sufficient night cooling or a purge first thing to bring that temperature back down. And I think to a degree, when you live in a house, you do that automatically. It certainly takes a bit of getting used to to closing all the windows when it's the hottest part of the day. There's, there's a, a bone in your body that says, I want to open that window. But you know that actually the insulation is going to work for you. So I'm very pleased with that little test. I also learned from Bjorn Kuriolf, who we've had on the podcast before, that a typical gain for a passive house, let's say it's a beautiful sunny day, is about three Celsius. So I suppose if you can cool it to 22 or so the day before, then probably you're only going to get up to 25 anyway. So it's, it's a bit like sailing a ship, isn't it? Just keeping things in order. But as I say, most of it comes instinctive to you. But I just thought you might be interested in that. Uh, I certainly enjoyed my experiment. So let's get to our featured interview with Neil Sutherland. Each year, the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, that's the ASBP, hold their Healthy Buildings Conference and Expo. And that's when I first learned about Macar. One of their projects, Tara Green, was up for an award there. And what I thought was particularly interesting was just the delivery. So they keep everything in-house, design, they've got off-site manufacture, and then they obviously assemble, but they do this all as a main turnkey service. So I want to find out how it works, this process, and why they work in this way. I started by asking Neil to tell me a little bit about his background. I don't have a, a conventional architect background, you might say, which is probably a good thing. So, yeah, I'm one of these characters who, um, yeah, I left school at 16 because uh, I didn't show much promise. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm actually dyslexic, not, not unlike a lot of other creatives, I guess if I could call myself that. So, um, yeah, I struggled a bit. I'm in my mid-50s, so give you some kind of idea of my schooling kind of um, period. So, yeah, I, I undertook a technical apprenticeship, actually, with um, an engineering company. I was very lucky to get an opportunity with that. And that essentially was around manufacturing and production engineering. Uh, so I, I undertook that for four and a half years, allowed me to grow up a bit, run around um, with money in my pocket and that type of thing when I was a young lad. And yeah, I got kind of tired of that when I got into my 20s. So I finished my apprenticeship and hit the road for uh, three or four months. Ended up in uh, right through Europe, really, wearing my kilt. You can probably tell <laughs> I have a uh, reason to do that. Uh, and the romantic bit is that when I was walking down the street, in, uh, in Florence, I found myself gazing at buildings, wondering how on earth somebody could actually actually manifest this kind of stuff. So I decided to come back uh, to Scotland and go and study architecture, which was a complete revelation to my family. They expected me to go and do something with engineering, but 
Yeah, I decided to pursue uh, that. I was incredibly fortunate to get straight into the course in Aberdeen at the uh, Robert Gordon Institute of Technology, it was called then. And um, yeah, I undertook my architectural training. And I was, again, incredibly fortunate. I was able to secure a, an exchange program to the Illinois Institute of Technology in my third year. So I ended up in Chicago for a year. And I was exposed to a lot of um, wonderful work by the likes of Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, and others. And that really set the scene, I think, for <laughs> what I've ended up doing, really. So just to, to kind of wind on a little bit further. So I finished my studies eventually with more travels in China and Tibet and things. And um, I did something completely reckless, which is to set up an architectural practice or a design practice immediately after finishing my my studies. And you don't do that kind of thing, you know, particularly if you want to be an architect. But I, I didn't I was never really driven by that. It was more which I guess will come out in this discussion. I was more driven by the desire to make wonderful places that change people's lives rather than the profession of architecture or any of that other kind of standard stuff around a, a kind of career and all that kind of stuff. I've never really been interested in any of that. So the other kind of key things, I suppose, to give you some idea of, of my background, I'm sitting at the moment in my office surrounded by a small farm. So we took on a, a, a piece of land. It's about 10 acres about 16 years ago, myself and my wife and our three then young sons. Uh, they're all grown up now. The youngest is 20. The oldest is 27. And um, yeah, we, we've we've made a big commitment to an organic farm. And uh, before that, we had some experience of, of, of managing land on the west coast of Scotland for a number of years. So we've mixed the kind of passion for making places, um, growing food, uh, being really, I guess, committed to uh, what, what one of your other um, recent interviewees called a, an ecological civilization, I guess, which maybe um, might lead into another question, I guess. Yeah, well, there are a few questions I have, and one of them is we feel like we haven't completed the story because what you offer these days is a complete package which is not an architecture firm really no we i often say things like we're not a, an architectural practice we're not a builder and we're not a manufacturer but in actual fact we're all three we we are a completely unique entity focused really on the delivery of great places so great houses we do other buildings as well but we're, we're really focused on that whole delivery side of things rather than limiting ourselves to design and then letting things run a course which is often a very disappointing one why <laughs> um, because it works for us really i mean we're talking about the, the the end of three decades of development work here so i think technically it's 28 years i've been in business it's a long-term commitment it's a life's work really and that, that says quite a lot about it, really. Um, I started off on my own. I, I plowed a, a, a lone single furrow for about 10 years, working out how best to design buildings. I was quite disappointed by the options open to me in terms of the delivery side of things. So I decided just to get on with it myself. So pretty early on, I, I tried to work with some others on that. And with varying success and around about the time we moved to the place we live now I had a couple of assistants at that time and things have moved very rapidly it's it's in conjunction with having a small piece of land we're able to develop a, a premises here so we have a couple of large workshops now and we now employ close on 50 people so it's, it's moved pretty quickly over that period, uh, there's been various ups and downs, but it's been uh, it's been an exciting journey, frankly. Is this all yourself, or do you supply for other people? Yeah, we we mainly design for manufacture and assembly of our own projects, but we have been known to take on 
the manufacture and assembly for other architects. As, so long as we can get them early enough to undertake the technical requirements, um, because designing for manufacture, one would imagine it would be different from designing for just conventional building, but it's it's actually s fundamentally different. Uh, so we're really intent on taking things from this kind of prototypical kind of situation to, to making it much more widely available. So, yeah, working with others, collaborating, all these things are, are, are possible. Um, we're, we're just quite busy, to be honest, with lots and lots of work at the moment. We know what we're doing this time next year, generally, because we're, we're so much in demand at the moment, which sounds a bit immodest, but we've built up a, a real kind of following, a real community around the kind of work we do up here now. And most of it's based in the Highlands. We also work in the kind of close regions to the Highlands, but yeah, we're, we're, we're at capacity. But that's not to say we can't uh, develop that capacity and grow a bit further because we're, we're quite ambitious in that sense. Well, it's quite an attractive prospect as a client to know, well, I've got a one contact source here and we're going to go the whole way through the process. They've done it lots of times before. So maybe we can break this up a little bit. And um, My first question is on design and build. What are the pros and cons of a design and build company? Okay, well, one of the main things, Ben, is that we provide certainty over a number of things. So we, we're, we're good designers, we're design-driven, but our service doesn't end there. That's the kind of critical thing. So we also offer certainty over program and uh, workmanship, let's call it that, and also cost. So, I mean, if you put all those things together, those kind of four certainties to a customer, we offer all these things in one package. And I mean, if you look at the alternative, which is to work with a number of consultants, perhaps an, an architect, an engineer, a cost consultant, and then then try and work with a, a builder of some description. Now, the, it's just a simple fact across uh, Scotland and the UK that, that, that there are fewer and fewer smaller competent building companies for, for reasons that perhaps we may or may not go into, but it's very difficult to find uh, a company who are motivated by the kind of ecological, progressive areas of, of, of working who are able to take on an architect's idea, uh, a set of ideas, and actually make them work. So, I mean, as the cradle-to-cradle -cradle guys would say, design is, is about intentions, you know, so what is the intention? As I've learned over the years, the intention's the first stage, but uh, one has to figure out how to get things delivered. The execution of things is perhaps far more challenging than, than coming up with uh, bright ideas, if you like. So what exactly goes into one of your projects when you're, you're thinking about making it ecological? Well, the, the three things that come together to make a, a wonderful outcome uh, with any project really are, are aspects that are often... Um, th there, there are three aspects I'll run through and I would su suggest at the outset that one or more of these is usually compromised in a standard uh, kind of approach to the design and delivery of, of housing. So the first one really is a thorough understanding of, of our customer's brief. And that's pretty important to get to know the customer a bit, to really sit down with them and, and really uh, understand what they're trying to do. And I mean, that, that brief has to be taken seriously. It, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to gather these threads together. It's a very personal thing to kind of understand someone's real needs. The, the second aspect is, um, is really site analysis, so contextual work. So everywhere has, a, has, has constraints and opportunities, uh, be it a, a beautiful wooded site or, or open hillside site or, or on the edge of a of a village or in the middle of a town, wherever it is, there's context, there's things to respond to, there's things that, that you want to exemplify, there's other things you want to kind of perhaps reduce. And then the third element is, is what I describe as a flexible delivery approach. So 
we have a, a, a custom focused manufacture and delivery approach here, which is based on a number of standardized approaches, particularly around the use of timber and the region's timber up in the north of Scotland here. So we've taken quite a lot of time to work out how to respond to the, you know, the most common renewable construction material, which is, is timber. And we just have such a wonderful context around timber up in the north here. So if you take those three elements, the customer's brief, the, the site analysis and a flexible delivery approach, and you don't compromise any three of those, you end up with, with a wonderful uh, outcome in our, in our experience. Timber is obviously a large part of what you do. How do you know the supply chain is steady and that you're actually using something that's been carefully harvested over the years? It's all going to be renewable. Is, is that just the industry in Scotland? I must admit, I know, don't know too much about timber from Scotland. Yeah, well, there's a certain context in the UK with timber. I mean, we got to very, very low levels of tree cover 100 years ago when the Forestry Commission was set up as a strategic resource after the First World War. We were down at 2 to 3% forest cover, you know, just the extraordinary levels of, of, of depletion. And in Scotland, we've not managed to build that up to about 18%. Now, the, the Scottish government's ambition is 25%. It's a wow. bit of an arbitrary, yeah, a bit of an arbitrary number. I mean, the, the average European cover is about 35, 37%. So things, you know, are, are improving. But as a result of that, Ben, we have a, a very unusual species mix in terms of, of forestry cover in, in the north here. So we're, we're dominated by what you call four commercial species complementary to each other which is a, a wonderful thing and they're mainly I mean the four species are pine that's mainly Scots pine uh, fir that's mainly Douglas fir the larches that's mainly European larch which is native to the Alps but not not Britain and the final one is is, is spruce uh, the European version is Norway spruce as we call it but Sitka spruce predominates in Scotland uh, something like 62 percent of the entire resource of Scotland is, is Sitka spruce I probably know more foresters in this part of the world than I do architects. Uh, I'm, I'm more comfortable <laughs> in some respects with that whole timber industry sector. I mean, I'm an advisor to the, the kind of Scottish government on how we actually take a wonderful resource that captures carbon. It's such a beautiful thing to live with, it's such a versatile material to build with. And um, we're, we're developing progressive ways of utilising it. So everything from Structural use to insulation, wood fibre insulation we're working on just now, to finishes, to pretty much everything. You can make a, a wonderful house predominantly out of timber. And some of that long-term thinking, which I think we need to, to move towards now, as a common and comfortable thing, can be done if you know what you're doing with timber. Uh, and that's a really refreshing, optimistic idea, I think. Is there any feedback from you as partially an architecture firm to what kind of timber you would want to use, or do you just use what is supplied, those four main species? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, so we what we're doing is we're, we're using the, the, the kind of common characteristics of, of those species for different applications. And we don't use chemical treatments as, as a general rule. There's one or two areas within a building where the British standard would suggest that the environmental conditions are such that you would need a durable timber or, or one that's been taken to a certain level of durability through a chemical treatment, but we try and avoid that. So, for instance, we would use spruce for, for the carcassing of a, of a panel type of construction. We would use Scots pine there as well, which is a common species to the drier parts of the eastern part of the country here. Douglas fir is a, a wonderful timber for large section use, for beams and posts and for exposed timber. And larch is a, a, is a naturally durable material which is used extensively on the external applications of buildings. So cladding, decking, uh, all the kind of external uses. And you don't actually have to, to put any uh, surface treatment on larch for it to actually last 
for an excess of 100 years under sort of normal cladding conditions. So we have a range of different timbers. I've not mentioned the hardwoods, and there are some other um, more specialized softwoods as well. But th- there's, a, there's enough there to do everything we want to do, to do it without chemical treatments, and to work in anticipation of the circular economy, in anticipation of the, the idea that timber buildings are, are uniquely adaptable in the sense that they are repairable, and, and you can change them, you can take them apart and put them back together again, this type of thing. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a sense surrounded in the north northern hemisphere by, by cultures that understand that whole timber thing perhaps better than we do. But we are progressing along the route of a timber culture now, I believe, and Macker is part of that uh, movement, I would say. What does it look like? You mentioned you're at capacity for the next year or so. Do you just phone up and say, I need this much timber and it's easy to get hold of? Or how does it work? Yeah, the, we, we, work, we work quite closely with the sawmillers. Part of the problem in this country, um, well, in, in Scotland and throughout the UK, is that a lot of the small to medium-sized sawmills have not survived. So we tend to have a few large sawmills and, and a small number of smaller ones. It's not necessarily the case in other parts of the world, in particular Europe, where you would naturally have um, small to medium-sized sawmills which relate to the, the, the local resource and, and how it's uh, used. So that's a bit of a challenge, but we are working with some of the bigger mills, and they have an interest in what we're doing. We would be buying uh, regular quantities of, of different types of timber fr- directly from sawmillers, to our specification. And what we've done, Ben, is we've looked at the resource and we've responded to the resource rather than the usual design approach, which would be to design something and then actually look around to how you, what you're going to use to build it. So so we have a very unique resource here and, and we, we know quite a lot about it. So we're responding to that, really. When things go through... Are you dealing with one building at a time and then going on to the next one, or can you do a few things at once? Yeah, we're we're generally building one at a time. Uh, we have a team of around fifteen operatives in our workshop, focused on on a what we call a custom manufacturing approach. So I could tell you a little bit more about that if you mm. like, but it's kind of in the middle of of a couple of extremes. So. I don't know if you know much about lean manufacture. It's really it, it's it emerged really from from the Toyota production system in the 80s. So a, a quick kind of resume on that. MIT uh, based research back in the 80s and 90s, trying to figure out why the Japanese were getting so good at uh, fabricating cars. They were so reliable. They were they were they were basically very very good products. And they, they figured out that they were they were following a an approach that had been developed over a number of decades over in Japan. And I won't go into it any further than that, but the fact is that most people who look at lean regard it as something to do with manufacture, something to do with hyper efficiency and, and lack of, of waste. But the, the real insight into this, guys, is that it's about people. It's about how to get people what motivates people to do good work, how to get people really motivated to, to do things carefully and with a lot of attention to, to, to detail and care. Uh, it's about driving out defects, getting things right the first time, really enjoying what they're doing, developing it. Uh, and again, that's now harping back to my experience as a as an apprentice engineer because it's a fact that when I worked as an engineer, as a young lad, I worked with some very creative people. And it's a fact that when I got to architecture uh, college, I, I was quite surprised how uncreative a lot of the people were there. It's when you, you go about making things, when you, when you connect the theory and practice of things together, you get a third thing that comes out, which is a kind of tangible, pragmatic capability, which is not held up as 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 important as it is in actual fact. So very often the people who are making things are the best people to ask how to improve the process. 
So we talk here, Ben, about process innovation, okay? So most people talk about innovation in terms of products, in terms of things, but we're talking about the process, how you actually improve the process. So Lean is somewhere in the middle of a kind of diagram with, with craft production at one extreme and mass production at the other. Lean production is somewhere in the middle. It's, it's a customized approach which which galvanizes ideas around craft and ideas around mass production, but it's neither of those two things. So it, it really, I, you can tell I'm a bit of a fan, <laughs> a bit of a kind of... Uh, uh, but you want to, when you've got a workshop, like you've been saying, to optimize what you're doing and yeah, make the quality and everything, the ecological side of it all work together. And there's always room for improvement, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And, and for example, the, the whole Passive House movement is a quality assurance kind of approach to, to things. And it's, it's, it's very, very well suited to what we're doing. So we're just finishing our second Massive House uh, project at the moment. And um, yeah, it's been a real joy because the attention to detail, the real commitment that comes from having people working on, on things, putting themselves into into the outcome of things and being really proud and, and very um, satisfied with, with the kind of work they're doing. So we use a term called meaningful work, which isn't my term, <laughs> I think it came from Wendell Berry or one of the Americans, but we are engaged in this whole idea of having work which is respectful towards everyone involved in that work, is respectful towards things beyond ourselves. So it's it's an ecological approach to engaging with, with the world. Who would want to be involved in work which isn't meaningful, which which doesn't make those connections? So every time we build a, a house, we know that it's going to impact on people's lives in a very profound manner. We're also really keen to encourage others to do a, to go down a similar path. So, for example, this afternoon I have John Bootland from the Passive House Trust <laughs> coming to see me. <laughs> He's up in the island. Say hello. Holiday. <laughs> I will do. And and John hasn't been here yet, but really really keen to to encourage people to come and see what we're doing. I've got another group from Brittany coming to see us in a couple of months. I've got a group from Japan coming. That's not to say we're doing anything unique, Ben, but what we are doing, we're doing it with, with with as much kind of capability as we have. And I guess, you know, that, that kind of rubs off on people. I mean, I've I've taken from other people as well. So I think this whole idea of creative endeavors, cooperating, across the pieces is, 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 is something which we don't do enough of, you know? Well, I was going to say that actually I, I feel in the ecological circles that it is something that seems to happen a fair amount. And people like John Bootland, he's, he's a good connector. He gets around. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I hope that goes well. Just finishing off then, so what comes out of the factory and how is it all put together on site? So what we're based on what we're focused on, Ben, is what we call large sub-assemblies. So we're not building in a conventional manner, which is using gravity to hold things up necessarily. So the way one would approach the, the, the making of these large sub-assemblies is radically fundamentally different. Uh, so you're making quite large pieces. The main constraint we have is transportation. We've worked out over the years that our ambition for a standard panel size is around about three meters wide because we can move that on the road relatively easily With uh, after you've told the police what you're doing. <laughs> so we aim for that. They're probably 4.8 or 6 meters long. Uh, we can also make things longer than that. Another key thing I think is to mention here is that it's not about speed. It's about quality, right? So speed and cost reduction uh, come after a period of time, if, if one focuses on quality and consistency around quality, one will naturally speed up and, and things will get a little bit cheaper over time. But off-site construction methods are certainly generally not cheaper, but they're a hell of a lot better and they're more consistent. And so what we're doing is we're making the pieces in sequence. We make floor panels, wall panels, roof panels, intermediate floor panels, we make post and beam elements, and the third 
well, the, you, you could say there's a, there's three pieces to it. There's panels of the type I've mentioned. There's post and beam elements. It's the second element, the second piece. And the third piece is is modular elements, mainly service modules. So parts of the house which have a lot of plumbing, ventilation, and electrics in them. So we make three-dimensional, uh, people call them pods, whatever you want to call them, modules. And we, we're looking to do as much of that servicing here. The more we can make in the workshop, the better it is as an outcome. And we're, we're still working very hard on this, actually, the whole modular side of things. But the future is about uh, having less and less equipment, uh, more and more fabric first, more and more simplicity around buildings, really. But you use the word optimization. So what equipment you do have, you have to make sure it is working well and it's optimized. So so we've got some ideas around how to do that. And we're working on that just now. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's enough work here to keep us busy for several lifetimes. <laughs> well, in that sense. I really enjoyed our chat today and it sounds like everything's going in the the right direction. So thanks for making time for us today. Cheers. Thanks very much. Head online to take a look at the show notes for this session, houseplanninghelp.com slash 258. You can review the main information again in our summary. We've also got some photos of various parts of the process, get you into the workshop, have a look at assembly on site and the finished homes, of course. If you've got a comment or you'd like to ask a question, we encourage you to scroll down to the bottom of the show notes and fire away there. We'll link you to MacArt, of course, so you can take a look at their website, houseplanninghelp.com slash 258. My call to action is to check out the hub because we've just added this month's live training session. Our guest expert was Kate de Selincourt and she's done a lot of writing on health. So in this call, we cover ventilation, particularly air quality, including moisture, overheating, VOCs, all of those things, how they might impact on our health, how we control them. We take a look at foam insulation as well. So that's in our latest conference call. That's now in the archive. We've got a new chapter of our in-depth video case study. We've got three of these now covering different build systems. The latest one is my own project. So we were filming throughout and just gradually each month, turning it around, turning it around. So we're nearing the end of the superstructure, actually. The cat slide roof at the back, we're having a look because we're up to wall plate level there. We also find out about the cavity closers. Mark talks about how much he works, actually, and what he does. He works a six-day week. He's a hard grafter and a lot of skill there, and he's got all the paperwork, so he explains about that. And the trusses arrive on site. So these have been prefabricated, which will mean when they go up, they will go up quickly. So all of that in the latest video. Then we've got the other aspects of the hub, the forum, the courses. I hold regular office hours. If you've got a particular question, then perhaps I can answer it, refer you to someone. That's what it's all about. Houseplanninghelp.com slash join. Next time we stay in Scotland, but we leave the mainland. We're heading for the Isle of Skye. Mike Coe, who we've had on a number of times before, we're catching up with him. He's virtually finished the superstructure of Portree Passive House. So this is exciting. Last time we left him, that's about a year ago, money was tight as well. So we'll find out how things have gone, how the money is going next time. That's it. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.